Good morning, church family. It's been, uh, I was just calculating my mind, I, I, it's been over four Sabbaths since I've worshipped here with you, and some of us have been away, some of us have been here all the way through, but as summer is coming to an end and the school holidays are ending, we're all starting to dribble back in. Um, been uh, away, went to big, big camp, but the week before that, we went down to a special uh, anointing service for my, uh, my wife's grandfather, and had a special, he, he's unwell, so if you were able to pray for him, please do pray for Nolan McGee. But, um, so I've been away on some family matters, some with big camp, and some for, just to have a bit of a rest, but we're back, it's a new year. A new Sabbath, and uh, it's a blessing to be able to, to worship with you this morning. Uh, as uh, having a conversation with my three-year-old daughter uh, just this morning, I was uh, reviewing some of my sermon notes, and while I was uh, doing so, my little girl came up singing, Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. You know the song? And she came up to me singing this song. I wanted to use this as a little fatherly daughter teaching moment. And I take her aside and I says, well, Katie, where does Jesus live? And she thinks for a moment and she, she points outside. Out, she says, outside. I said, oh, well, where does Jesus live? She says, up in the clouds. I said, oh, are you, you talking about heaven? She says, yes, he, he lives in heaven. I said, that's right. Now, I'm wanting to bring this a little bit more closer to home, a little bit more personal for my, my daughter. And I said, well, where else does Jesus live? And she says, in Canada. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And now, after I thought and had a little chuckle about that, I thought about this, that my little three-year-old's daughter's mind, and we've instructed her of people that she doesn't know very well or hasn't seen much or at all, her uncles and aunties, her grandparents that live in Canada, these are people that she loves and holds dear and so she must mean that all those people that are loving and she hasn't seen or know very well, they must live in Canada. So would Jesus live there too. Where's your heart focused this morning? Is it on your homeland of heaven? Of your Canada? <laughs> the beauty is, is that through faith in Jesus, he can dwell right here. And that eternity, it can start right now, and through our relationship with Him. So, as we continue in our, our discussion and Bible study this morning, I want to invite you one more time. We're going to have a word of prayer as, as we begin. So please bow your heads with me. Our Father in Heaven, we want to pause right now as we acknowledge this moment, this space, that we want to commit it to You. We want You to do Your work in our life. We want to see new glimpses of you. We want you to speak and to maybe touch those things on our hearts that are, are keeping us uh, from seeing you more clearly. So please come and speak in, into each of our lives. Make this a one-size-fit-all message. And uh, most of all, that, that, that Jesus might be lifted up. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you can see that up there. There's an interesting combination on the screen of, a, of an earth-moving combination. You have a, a tractor pulling a, a scraper or a scoop, as, as the earth movers call them, a scoop. Is that right, Mark? Is that a scoop? And uh, the way this operates is you drag it behind a tractor, and there's a blade on the bottom of it, and it scoops up the dirt and fills up, and uh, it's really handy because you can load yourself with dirt and you can unload yourself with dirt. Now, I was standing with Pastor Adrian this week. Now, I hadn't seen him for a whole week, and I missed him, so I had to go visit him, right? <laughs> so I went up to his house, and outside his house there was a, a combination of an earth-moving uh, uh, operation of, of this, this type was going on. This was not it, but it looked just like that. And um, they were uh, scraping and, and developing the subdivision that is going in right beside Pastor Adrian's house. And as we were sitting here having a chat, we were observing this, and um, they were building uh, or stacking the dirt in this long pile, like a, a bund or a, a, to stack up the dirt. So they come and would drive the scraper and unload it in the same place over and over so the dirt would stack up higher and higher. And as this uh, was happening, 
as it was getting higher and as they get up higher, the, the top of the mound was coming more and more unstable. And uh, as we witnessed, the tractor had come around and was about to unload its load, and the tractor slides off the top of the bund and is just kind of hanging there precariously about to tip over. And you know what my first thought was, or my, actually what I verbalized to Pastor Adrian? You know what I said? I said he was probably texting. <laughs> He's probably texting. And Adrian's, oh, yeah, maybe he was. I think when he came by, he might have been on his phone. And we start to kind of judge and assess. And all of a sudden, I've become quite a professional in the area of earth moving and recognizing all the faults that this guy probably had done wrong, right? Have you ever witnessed someone make a mistake? Yeah? And all of a sudden, you're an expert in the situation, and you know all about it, right? It's interesting how we work like that. Moving forward in our discussion, we'll come back to this thought a little bit later, but I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1, and this is a snapshot. I don't anticipate you to be able to read that up on the screen, but that is the picture of the verses that we're going to be looking at of Romans 1, verse 18 through 32. In Romans chapter 1, and over these next about three chapters or so, Paul is developing a thought about the universality of sin, of how it's all-encompassing, it's everywhere. And in the Jewish mind as they would have been reading Romans chapter 1, I want you to notice whose sins Paul is identifying here, okay? In Romans chapter 1, and starting from verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clear and seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That says, because although they knew not God, they did not glorify him as God, for were, for were thankful, but because of the futile, uh, became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts uh, were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Jumping down to verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness and to the lusts of their hearts. And for verse 26, for this reason God gave them up for, to their vile passions. For even um, their women exchanged the unnatural use for what, it was, uh, for what is against nature. Likewise their men and so forth. And jumping down, we get into the nitty gritty of sort of the sins that Paul is listing and you might say who they belong to. In verse 28 it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to those things which are not fitting. And verse uh, 30 it says, They were backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, and the list goes on, right? All these different sins. Now, who do these sins belong to? Did you catch it as we were reading that Paul was identifying that these sins belong to a certain group of people? Who are they? Those that don't worship God. And he actually keeps saying over and over, they, them. Those ones, out there. You might say, just for fitting of example, it was, it was they, and, and it's hard to see on the screen here, but there's over 20 times where Paul says, they or them or theirs, sins. We like to talk a lot about other people's sins, other people's mistakes. It's a lot easier, isn't it? Right? They, them, and, and, and just for analogy purposes, it might say those that are Without, like our friend said here, those that didn't believe in God, those that are maybe outside of the church, right? It's a fun, it's a very palatable conversation, you know, it's, 
It's interesting. You know, we, we call it something, like maybe a word that's going through your mind right now is gossip, but we've sanctified it a little bit in the church, and we call it sharing, right? We have a little sharing session. Hey, and, and tell me, have you ever been involved in that conversation where someone comes up and says, hey, did you hear? Did, 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 did you see? You know? And uh, we have these sanctified gossip sessions. Now, there's an interesting passage in the, in, in, in the book called Adventist Home. It talks about uh, gossiping and tailbearing. Now, look at this. I love this sentence. Read, read it here. It says, We think with horror of the cannibal who feasts on the still, warm, and trembling flesh of his victim. Isn't that a nice sentence? Isn't that a very vivid description? We think with horror of the cannibal who feasts on the still warm and trembling flesh of his victim. But are the results of even this practice more terrible than are the agony and ruin caused by misrepresenting motive, blackening reputation, and dissecting character? Mm, Those palatable conversations like a cannibal sticking into a new, warm, juicy steak of, hey, did you hear? So-and-so did this. Ah, oh, they're so foolish. Did, did you hear? They said this. Oh, really? And there's like blood dripping from our mouth as we say it. Let the children and the youth as well learn what God says about these things. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And that's so true. That's so true. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And there's been very, lots of people that have actually killed themselves because of what other people have said about them. That it just becomes so overwhelming that, that people have developed these ideas about them that they just can't stand it anymore. Of all the funning and mocking and jiding it. Hey, look at that that they just can't take it anymore and they've end their life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The spirit of gossip and tailbearing is one of Satan's special agencies to sow discord and, tr- and strife, to separate friends. Do you know that to be true? Have you ever had a really good buddy, but then something was said behind their back and, and, and you might have participated in that conversation and, and all of a sudden feelings are hurt and characters are misrepresented and the friendship is nil and over. To separate friends and to undermine the faith of many and the truthfulness of our positions. It's interesting that there are entire empires that are built on this very palatable conversation of gossip, of canni- modern-day cannibalism, right? You ever seen any some of these magazines? These, hey, did you hear? Or it might be, or they could have said. And there's the maiming of characters and of people and their motives. We like to talk about their, them, they, their sins. It's a lot easier to talk about, isn't it? And Paul, when he was writing Romans chapter 1, you could almost maybe see the whole congregation just kind of like nodding their head. Yeah, those, those godless people, those backbiters, those, those gossipers, those, those, those evil, evil people. Yeah, just, you know, they, yes. And then Paul changes his tone when he flip over the page to Romans chapter 2. So you're still with me there in Romans chapter 2. And it says in verse 1, Therefore you are inexcusable, O oh man, for you are, who, for whoever you are, mm. oh man, let me start over, I've stumbled up my words, blah, blah. therefore you are inexcusable, O oh man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Could it be that when we see and witness the sins in other people's lives that maybe we're so quick to recognize it because maybe we've practiced it ourselves. But we'd rather talk about that than talk about me. 
for example, when I was going to uh, high school, when I was in high school, I, um, I sang in the choir. I was a choir boy. You know, I was a good boy. Um, but I also had a little bit of an ornery streak in me, too. And I like to try not to mix those, those two character and personality traits in me. I liked the staff in the school around me, the boarding school, to see the choir boy. But I liked the students to be able to see the ornery side of me, you know? And then those two sides shouldn't meet, right? And some of these rules in this school that I attended, you weren't allowed to have relationships um, we're not to have a girlfriend, right? It was just a plain and simple rule. Like, there was a boarding academy. You come there. It's there to study. That's it. You come to do school to uh, engage in friendships and relationships, broad and wide, rather singling out individuals. And actually, as I've become older, I've seen the value in maybe, especially as a young person, to try and be broad in our friendships and relationships. Um, maybe in the application of how they applied some of those things, at this school, it could have been maybe done a bit better. That's all I'm going to say about it. Either way, when I was a student, I was a good choir boy. But I learned how to find the holes in the system, if you understand what I'm saying. I learned how to be naughty without being noticed, right? I learned how to even have a relationship with a, a girl without the school or the staff knowing, right? And uh, some of those little tricks and tactics were, now, young people, we actually wrote notes on paper, okay? So what we would do, you'd write a note with a, like a pencil or pen, not a text message or a Facebook message or Instagram. It would actually take a piece of paper and you'd write on it, and then you would uh, maybe, uh, maybe drop some, like, water on it to make it look like you cried over that letter or something. I don't know. But you would do whatever you could. And you would, you would then run down, you would slip the note in their locker, and then you would have to think for the rest of the day, I was in such a hurry, did I actually put it in the right locker? <sighs> and so you'd have to worry about some of these things, right? And I became good at being naughty but not being noticed. Now, the Lord got a hold of me, and through um, uh, maturing and growing older, I actually came back to work at that school later on, okay? And there was something that, um, that I noticed that these, some of these rules still applied. And I was able, as I was now older, where just a few years prior, I was in the same place as these kids, and I was able to witness when budding romances were taking place. Why? Because I had experienced and done the very same things that they would have done. Right? For example, I would have uh, uh, maybe, well, everybody was at, uh, at, a, at, a, at a similar meeting place like the cafeteria doing mealtime. Everybody's hungry. We're all going to come eat. But you pick those times to be somewhere else to meet with your little, uh, what would you call it? situation, right? And so I would notice these things as a staff now, that when students would be kind of looking to the left and the right, and kind of sneaking out the back door of the cafeteria, I was able to witness what you might say the sin. I could recognize it. I was quick to recognize it because I was very familiar with it in my own heart. Does that make sense? And so it is, you know, and that's a kind of a funny and, and, and childish way, um, but we are quick to recognize and to point out and to point figures because maybe we wrestle with something very similar, if not some sin in our life, but we want to talk about theirs and not ourself. So Paul, in chapter 1 of Romans, he goes and he talks about them, yes. And as Christians, we need to recognize, yeah, there, there is sin, right? There is sin around us. But he changes the direction of his conversation in Romans chapter 2, and he says... Therefore you are inexcusable, O oh man. Verse 2, For we know the judgments of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, that you who judge those practicing such things and are doing the same, that you will escape the judgments of God? 
Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? It's interesting. We want to talk about mercy. We want to talk about grace. We want to talk about God's goodness when it applies to me. But we like to be very cannibalistic about other people's sins. <laughs> we like to talk about those. And what Paul is saying here is that when we don't apply that same grace and mercy and goodness that God has given to our own life, and we throw that out the door when we're looking at other people, that we're despising the goodness of God, that we're despising His riches, His grace, His mercy. See, it has to work both ways. It has to work towards me, and it has to work towards those around us. So Paul changes the theme of his conversation in Romans chapter 2. About 16 times in the first part of this chapter, he's not talking about them, he's talking about you now. He gets to the heart of the matter. And the point that he's trying to make is, is that what's out there for sin, and what's here on our own carnal hearts that we don't like to talk about and to confront, same, same thing. You see, oh, the words are kind of covered up there. When I was so quick to judge that man this week, and it tipped over that, uh, almost tipped over that, he didn't even tip it over, he almost did. This was me a few years ago, right? Where I had fully tipped an earth-moving machine over, right? Now, I'm quick to judge because I recognize this mistake and sin. I wasn't texting, by the way. I was going too fast. <laughs> and I tipped this machine over. And uh, I'm quick to judge, and all of a sudden, I don't want to talk about my mistakes. I want to talk about yours, them, they. So, where's the balance? We talk a lot about, let's not judge people. Let's not condemn other people with our words. But as Christians, does that mean that we should just turn a blind eye to sin, just close our eyes when something blatant or wrong is going on among us or around us. So we just go, oh well, I don't want to judge. Who knows? Look at what the counsel of God's Word says to us in Galatians 6 verse 1. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, or those that are following or being led by the Spirit, should restore that person, what does it say there? Gently. Gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. So, what word comes to mind when you read that last phrase, but watch yourself, or else you may be tempted as well? What, what comes to mind when you, when you read that passage? Tempted, yep. I see, be careful, yeah? Be cautious, don't, don't go in there with guns a-blazing, but be careful because maybe the same thing might trip you up too. And so I think really our take-home here from this passage is, is you know, instead of coming in and, and uh, you know, a close friend of mine, um, about 10 years ago, I was having a conversation with them, and they were struggling with smoking. They wanted to give up. He says, a lot of good and uh, caring people have come up to me and says, you should stop smoking. Should we say that to people? <laughs> I grab their arm and sniff them in the foyer of the church and they say, you should stop smoking. And they're like, yeah, I'm trying. He says, I know what, drink more water. That'll help you. Every time you want a cigarette, drink a glass of water. That'll fix you for sure. He says, that's not helpful at all. And these kind-hearted people, they come and they grab my arm and they give me these words of counsel and rebuking my sin, so to speak. And then they go home and they drink their mango and, uh, and, and strawberry smoothies while watching 3ABN, feeling very justified that they've done their part of rebuking sin. Right? It's not helpful. Stop it. Don't do that anymore. Is that we need to be able to come aside and gently and cautiously. We don't know what it 
even feels like to even try to quit smoking. Some of us do, some of us don't. But wouldn't it be a little bit more helpful to be like, hey, I'm having smoothies tonight at my house. Why don't you come over? Let's have a smoothie, and we're going to you know, watch the highlights on 3ABN or whatever. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Is that we can be a lot more gentle in our approach. And I would advise that before we go and confront someone else's sin, and there's a lot of counsel in the Scripture about this, is that we need to go to Jesus with our own sin first. Lay it before him and say, this is real. Jesus, these are my struggles. I give it to you. And I want you to remove every bit of pride, every bit of, of self-righteous uh, uh, mentality that I might have towards the, this, this, this othering of thinking that their sin is worse than mine. That you remove all of that and say that their struggle is just as genuine as my struggle. And then I visualize in my mind's eye Jesus dying on the cross for their sin too. That Jesus loving them with those loving eyes of, of pity and care when they seize us in my struggle and in their struggle, seeing Jesus in my mind eye loving them. Then, gently and humbly, if you want to go forward and talk to them and have those hard conversations... I'd have to say maybe this, that first we need to have a relationship with that person. We need to go through our own repentance before we go to rebuke, if that makes sense. Relationship, repentance, maybe those can happen simultaneously before you want to, if you need to call it that, rebuke someone of, of sin. And then I don't think it's so much called then judgment that when we do go forward and have those conversations with those people that we love, but it's actually love, right? That I've had conversations with people when I used to work at that school. I worked in the boys' dormitory. And uh, it's interesting when you're instructing these young men how to kind of live lives, that sometimes you would walk into their room and, boy, it stunk in their rooms. In a boy's room that's been living, they're the only occupant in this room, and it just stinks. And I remember we were about six months into the year, and I go into this boy's room. I've ignored the smell. <laughs> I've had a relationship with this young boy. We are, have a friendship. You know, my own room smells pretty good. I've kind of set things right in my own home. But I've gone in, and I finally said, Listen, brother, your room stinks. Stinks. And I need to tell you this because I love you. And all these other people love you too, but that's why they're not visiting you, because your room stinks. And we start going through the list. What could be the reason? Have you washed your clothes? Yes, I washed my clothes. Have you vacuumed? Yes, I vacuumed. Are there any food under the bed? No food under the bed. When was the last time you washed your sheets? I haven't. Like this week? No, no, I haven't. Like this month? No, I, I, they've been there for the last six months. I said, get those things off of here right now. Right? I love you, brother, and I can't allow you to be in this place anymore in those dirty sheets. Right? Because I've been there before, too, because my own bed has stink, and I recognize that, but I've dealt with that. I've repented of that, and I've gone, and I can in love and in care, because I have a relationship with that person, and they're willing to take that on board because I have that relationship and that friendship with them. And he washed his sheets, and his room smelled beautifully. Romans 1 and 2, the difference between, uh, is Paul has the discussion about sin, the universality of sin. He talks about their sin and he talks about my sin, right? And there's no difference, right? There's no difference of the sin that is outside of the church to the sin that is inside of the church, right? Is that this othering or difference that sin is sin and, and God loves and desires to save both. Jesus died for sinners, not just the good ones, right? He died for you, and we love to sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and leaning on the promises.'" And Jesus died for you, but he also died for them, for the others, for they, those that we like to talk about. So turn with me in your Bibles now to Romans chapter 3. This was the punch. This is where, where Paul was going with his argument. He talks about them, he talks about you. And in Romans chapter 3... And in verse 21, it says, 
But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. And there is no difference. See? There is no difference for their sin or my sin. And there is no difference that Jesus' grace, His forgiveness, His love, He wants to apply it to all. He didn't just come for the good sinners. He came for the bad ones too. It says, For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Greek, a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist or Presbyterian. Jesus died for all. And I pray that when we come away from these spaces and these places that we talk about God and His Word, we talk about His grace, we talk about His love, how it is bestowed and poured upon us, that we would look in that lens at the people of others, that we don't despise the riches of God, that we don't despise His goodness by looking down our noses at their mistakes, at their failings, at their shortcomings, but that we would get to know them, that we'd get to love those people, and that we go to Jesus and say, Jesus, help me to see them through your eyes. And yes, maybe God will open up a door so that you can have a hard conversation, not in a judgmental tone, but in a loving tone, saying, brother, sister, I love you, but your room stinks. Right? I love you. Let's work together. I have struggles too. I love you, and I, wanna, I want to walk with you into the kingdom. God's helping me, and I believe God can help you. I love you. At the end of the school year, when I was working at that school, we uh, would do a big clean. The kids are gone, so it was great. We could do some work where we would uh, kind of listen to some music, and we would paint. Um, we would take a year where we'd paint a whole floor of the dorm. The next year, we'd paint the next floor. So about every four or five years or so, the each, each room was getting a new fresh coat of paint so that when the new boarder would come into the dormitory, they'd have a nice, tidy room. And this year, we, they decided they were going to shampoo the carpets. Now, I had a, a staff room in that dormitory, and I kept it neat and tidy, trying to be an example to these young boys that I'm mentoring and, and guiding along in life. And as I'm going along, and we got one of these, these machines called a rug doctor. Have you ever seen one of those before? Okay, so we, uh, <laughs> I come to kind of anticipate the, the color of the water um, after cleaning certain boys' rooms. Now, some boys that had just come from the outback of America somewhere, and they came with their big muddy work boots, and they would come in and out, and I knew mud and dirt was getting just uh, uh, crammed into that carpet. And sure enough, it would come out in a, in a deep, dark slurry, that water after cleaning their floor. And as I'd go along, some rooms were cleaner, yet some boys there a bit tidier. But something I noticed, that I came to my room, and I come to anticipate that it's not going to be that bad, is it? And I clean the floor in my room. It's just as dirty, just as muddy, just as filthy as all the other boys in the dorm. I think that's a perspective that we need to take. Is that when we look at others, that we are just as much a sinner as they are. And needing of God's steam cleaning in our life, His cleansing stream. So as we go forward today, I want to challenge you, challenge myself to pursue relationships, to pursue repentance 
in our own lives. That if it comes to me that we need to rebuke, that it's done in love. Done in love because we have a relationship with that person. Amen? All right, in closing, I want to sing the song, uh, Guide Me Thou, O Great Jehovah. So we'll invite our song team up.